John chapter 9, continue going through the book of John, and I hope you all have been getting a lot from these studies, and just a common theme that we are seeing throughout the book of John is just believe Christ, believe Him, believe Him, believe on Him, trust His words, do what He says, and then throughout the Bible, uh, we see salvation, it is by grace through faith, you know, believe God, uh, believe His word, believe what He tells you to do, and um, it's... It is the key, and so uh, one of the things I've talked about this a lot before, whenever we preach on the miracles of Jesus, there is always a spiritual message that Jesus was trying to get across. When he would heal somebody, whatever the miracle he would do, whether it be healing miracle, feeding 5,000, uh, raising somebody from the dead, there was always a spiritual lesson that we're supposed to learn from that. Because he didn't just come to, once again, to... Uh, you know, fix people's physical problems. He wanted to fix their spiritual problems. That is why he came. That was why, that's uh, what he came for. And so here in this, in chapter nine, we're going to see a story of another miracle that Jesus did. And any, and, and, you know, anytime you do, anytime you read a miracle, you're, when you're reading the Bible and you read about a miracle of Jesus, try to find the spiritual message in there. And we do in a lot of churches, uh, you know, especially in the charismaniac churches, they love talking about the miracles of Jesus. And then they will use these miracles that Jesus did to kind of get people excited. You know, if they're, you know, having health problems, they'll talk about the miracles of Jesus. And, you know, and then, all right, come f- forward, folks, and let's lay hands on you and let's heal you of your physical problems. And listen, I'm not against praying for people and trying to help people with their physical problems. But do you understand that if we don't get the spiritual message, we're not really getting anything. The spiritual message is so much more important, and most churches today are leaving that out, and we can't do that. So let's go ahead and let's let's start reading in verse 1, and it says, As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. And I've preached on this before, but I want to I want to make sure this gets repeated because we need to understand this. That you know, not every th- bad thing that happens is because of sin. And sometimes as Baptists, we are horrible about this. We will see something bad going on in someone's life, and we'll think, you know, we'll start pronouncing judgment. You know, you know why this is happening to do you, don't you? This is happening because you're wicked. Can anybody think of somebody in the Old Testament that that happened to? Job. Job, we see that in the Bible in chapter 1, he was a perfect and upright man, one that feared God and has chewed evil, and he went through all those horrible things. And then most of the, seems like most of the book of Job is his friends trying to figure out why God had all that bad stuff happen to him. They're all trying to figure out what's the sin in your life? What did you do wrong that caused God to bring all this judgment upon you? And it turns out he hadn't done anything wrong. God wanted to be glorified in this situation and God used that situation in Job's life to help millions of people. But, you know, Job didn't know that when it was happening. His friends didn't know that. But, you know, we will get ourselves in trouble when we start going and trying to figure out why bad things are happening to people. That is a dangerous thing to do. That is a foolish thing to do. And I've said this before, but I think it needs to be repeated. Preachers are sometimes the worst about this. If, if somebody's going through something hard in their life, you know, what caused it, it all depends on whether or not that person is in good favor with the preacher. If somebody you know, in the church is going through a hard time, well, if they're in good standing in the church, if they're attending regularly, if they're giving their tithe, Satan's fighting these folks. We need to pray for them. Satan's attacking them. But if it's somebody who's not in good graces with the church, somebody who maybe they've been missing, they haven't been doing everything they're supposed to do, Judgment of God is on them. And let me tell you, folks, you know, that, that is just a horrible thing to do. That is dangerous. And if you want to go around doing that, go for it. But boy, you better be right. You better be right. And just understand that is the type of judging we're not supposed to do. That's when the Bible talks about not judging, we should not do that. Listen, uh, if when you do, when you see people going through hard things, don't try to figure out why. Just pray for those people. 
Just pray for them. Be a help. Be an encouragement to them. God might be trying to do something great in their life through that. And so you know what? Just be a help. And that's what the disciples did. Here's the guy. He's been born blind. And that was a stupid question too. Who did sin this man or his parents? Well, if he was born blind, you know, how could it have been his sin? You know, and so, you know, maybe they thought that God in his sovereignty knew that there was some great sin that he was going to do. So he struck them blind from, you know, that's just, that's ridiculous. And that is, that's a horrible attitude. And I see preachers do it all the time. And they do. They're trying to get people in the church to stop doing some sin. And they can't find any Bible to prove that it's bad. So what do they do? They tell a scary story about somebody, this one person, they got away from God and they went and they started messing with stuff that we shouldn't be messing with. And all of a sudden, you know, they got in a car wreck and they got crippled and it was the judgment of God upon their life. You know, and we don't, are you sure? Are you absolutely sure about that? Be, be careful. But then it, but once again, if it's their friend that it happens to, it was Satan attacking them. And so don't do that. Let me tell you, some of the best people I know, you know, have gone through some of the most horrible things that you can imagine. You know, my favorite missionary that has ever walked the face of the earth is in heaven right now from a car wreck after going through, I mean, trial after trial after trial while he was in his ministry, he just kept being faithful, faithful, faithful. And that man went through so many horrible things. And I'm telling you right now that, you know, I think it was because Satan was attacking him, but somebody who didn't like him would probably say it was got the judgment of God on him. And you know what? I don't, I'm not going to try to figure that stuff out. I'm not going to try to sort that stuff out. You know, that's between them and God. And we just need to be a help to whoever we can be a help to. And don't go pronouncing judgment on people. And don't, if you're, if you want to do that, go ahead, but you better be right. Because if you are, if you're saying they're going through that because they've been out of church, well, make sure you don't ever get out of church. Because if that's what you think God should do to people who get out of church, then, man, you know, it's probably going to happen to you if you get out of church. So just watch it. Sometimes bad things do happen because of someone's sin. But I don't recommend making those judgments. Be very careful. Sometimes God allows bad things to happen so he can do a great work. I think that's the case here with this man. God allowed it to happen because there, God knew one day that there was going to be an opportunity where Jesus would be able to heal this man and not only just heal this man of his blindness, but be able to teach a great and wonderful lesson to the world. And through this miracle, we see this man get saved in this story. Had he not been blind... Who knows if he would have ever paid any attention to Jesus. Had that man not been born blind, he may have died and gone to hell eventually. I get, and so it turns out, I believe it was probably a good thing that he was born blind. But you know, most of the time when it comes to circumstances, why bad things happen, we'll probably never know why they happen until we get to heaven. And so it's really pointless to try figuring it out. Just, just trust God. And we should never ask the question, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? Right, how many has heard that before? You know, why do bad things happen to good people? It's, a lot of people we use that as an excuse for getting out of church and getting away from God. You know, I just don't understand why God will let something so bad happen to someone so good, usually talking about themselves. I got out of church because this happened to me. You know, why would God let that happen to me? Do you know how arrogant that is? We should never ask, why do bad things happen to good people? We should ask, why do good things happen to bad people? Anybody who says that doesn't understand their sin. We should ask the question every day, why does good things happen to bad people? Why does God bless me the way he has? Not why did God take away one of my family members, but why did God give me those family members? You know, why, why did, you know, and you, you'll have people too. And listen, if you lose a loved one, Go ahead and be sad. There is nothing wrong with being sad because you lost a loved one. If you love that person, if you had a great relationship, you're going to be sad. Okay. Nobody's mad at you for that. Okay. But at the same time, we're not supposed to sorrow as others who have no hope. Okay. And if you do, if you lose that person, don't ask the question, why did God take them away from me? Ask the question, Lord, why? What did I, you know, why would you give them to me for so many years? You know, 
Why, why did you bless me with them all those years? You know how many funerals I've been to where nobody cared that the person was dead? I mean, hardly anybody was even at the funeral. You know, and, you, and you see that and it's like, that person died and nobody's even sad. I talked to a pastor here in town one time and he said one of the things that he does at gravesides that he occasionally does, but now he's careful about it, is at the graveside, he'll just ask people, you know, because you don't want to, at funerals, you don't want people to start giving testimonies because it goes down, they start going down memory lane and it can go real long. So what he would just do is he'd just kind of open up. Somebody describe this person in one word. And, you know, and people would just say, you know, loving, caring, generous, you know, and everybody just kind of does it that way. Well, they did it with one, one guy one time and everybody started saying horrible things. Selfish. Jerk. Ignorant. I mean, they're all saying these terrible things about this person. He was just like, oh, what do you do? <laughs> what do you do now? You know, and, and nobody was sad. Nobody was sad that this person was dead. And it was like they all had to be there out of obligation. And listen, we all hate being sad. But would, it, would, would you rather that be the situation? You know, if your mom or your dad dies and you're at that funeral, do, would it make you feel better if you were glad that they were dead? Listen, if you're sad, that says, hey, there was a lot of love. There was a lot, there was a lot of good. You had a lot of good years. That's why you're sad. The fact that your heart is broken shows that you obviously had some wonderful times. There was obviously a lot of love there. And you know, you ought to thank God for the sadness. It could be one of those funerals where nobody cares. And you know what? When I die, you know, I do. I want, my, I want my family to take comfort in the fact that they'll see me again in heaven someday. But you know what? I hope they're crying too. I, I hope some people are going to be sad. You know, I, and, and, um, but you know, sometimes though, uh, at the same time, what everybody ought to think is, you know, if I die tomorrow, I, you know, your attitude shouldn't be, you know, why did God take Pastor Tommy from us? It should be, hey, why did God allow us to have Pastor Tommy for six years? That should be the attitude. That should be what we say. And so, you know, how, how do we know when bad things are because of sin? Turn over to Luke chapter 13, verse 1. Luke chapter 13, verse 1. It says, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering and said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? Some Galileans went through some horrible things. Many of them died. Do you think this happened to them because they were worse than the other Galileans? He said, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He brings up a couple things that had obviously happened in their recent history, bad things, Knowing these people's wicked hearts, you probably think they were worse than everybody else, don't you? You probably think they deserve those things, don't you? But Jesus said, you know what? That's not why those things happen. He said, I tell you, neighbor, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Every one of us have done something that we deserve to die for. And so, really, the truth is, I don't think we're, we can know when bad things happen because of sin. And so you know what we just need to do is understand that sometimes bad things do happen because of sin. And so you know what? I'm going to keep sin out of my life as much as I possibly can. If I'm going to suffer, I don't want it to be as an evildoer. I want to suffer. If I'm going to suffer, I want to suffer as a Christian. If I'm going to suffer, I want to suffer like Job suffered. I'm not going to suffer as an evildoer, as a busybody in other men's matters. I don't want that kind of suffering. And so we need to understand how dangerous that is to be trying to figure out why people are suffering. Don't you ever go to someone who's lost a loved one, going through a hard time, and just and have that attitude. And it's like, well, has God got a hold of you yet? Did you learn your lesson? When you go to a funeral of a family member, they lose a child or something like that, did you learn your lesson? Oh, I mean, man, you are so wicked if you do something like that. Don't ever do anything like that. And I know people that have, that have done that. People have been going through difficult times. They lost a loved one. They lost a family or they were dealing with some type of you know, major illness. I, my uncle, uh, my great uncle, who is a pastor, I mean, a great man of God. I mean, he went through some horrible things in his life. He lost two children. 
you know, his wife uh, went through some, had some terrible health issues and things that she went through. He ended up dying with Alzheimer's. And there were people that came along and their words of comfort to him were, you know, what did you do wrong? I mean, you know, and just, I mean, just absolutely wicked. And I tell you, people like that, they need, to, they need to go jump in the lake. Don't ever be that way. And so, verse 4, it says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. So right here, you know, Jesus, when he talks about, you know, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus is basically saying right here, you know, he had to take advantage of the opportunities he had that were presented to him. Okay, here he is. It's the Sabbath day. There's a lot of people around. Here is a man who is blind. Okay, he needs to take advantage of this opportunity to... Give this man sight. You know why? Because Jesus Christ, he is the light of the world. Okay? Now, so, and, and think about this. We had mentioned in a couple chapters before, uh, it talked about, I uh, mentioned that prophecy about Jesus, how he was that great light. Okay? And here he refers to himself as the light of the world. And it's interesting, he says that in a story where he's going to heal a man of his blindness. Okay? Now, understand... N- you know, I'm not a scientist. I don't know a lot about a lot of things, okay? But I do know that without light, we can't see, can we? Okay? All of us in here, we all have a form, a shape, a look. But y'all understand, if there is no light, we can't see, can we? We can't tell what, where anything is. Has anybody ever been in, like, you know, total darkness before, okay? I mean, just absolute Total darkness. We went last year when we were in Branson, we went down in the cave and we got way down deep in that cave and then they shut the lights off down there. And man, it was, it was weird being in something that dark where you can't see anything. And it wasn't that I went blind. It was just, there was no light. Therefore I could not see. And we, this man here, he's blind. He can't see Jesus Christ. He is that light of the world. What is he trying to do? He's trying, he's, once again, he's speaking spiritually here. He's trying to be that spiritual light. We saw earlier in John that he was that light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. In John 3, it talks about how men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Those who are going to be able to understand spiritual things, they will not be able to see those things unless they have Jesus Christ in their life. These people walk in darkness. The world, it sees the things that we do as, you know, it watches us as Christians. It sees the thing, they see the things that we do and it makes no sense to them. Why? They are in darkness. It, I've never done this before, but I, you know, I, I can't imagine how would you explain color to a blind person? One who, one who is born blind. How would you do that? How would you describe that to them? You know, is it is that is there any way they could possibly understand those things? You know, colors when they are blind, when they've never seen anything. You know, how how could you explain beauty to them or ugliness to a blind person? You know, you just I, I don't I don't know how. And how can you explain spiritual things to people who are spiritually blind? Okay? And a person will be, continue to be spiritually blind until they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And sometimes as Christians, we, we waste a lot of time trying to explain a lot of things to lost people that they are incapable of understanding. They have to get their sight first, and then you could explain those things to them. You know, and I've wondered this before too, okay? If a person, let's say they're 40 years old, and I don't know, some people might know about this who've studied this stuff. If a person lived 40 years never having seen a thing, and then all of a sudden they had their sight restored, 20-20 vision, what, you know, what would that do? 
when all of a sudden they start seeing people and things, would they automatically, you know, know how to run around and avoid certain things? And I, I don't know. You know, it, it seems weird. You know, you and I, we know if we're walking through here to just kind of watch those spots in the pews right there because if you hit your shin on them, it hurts really, really bad. You know, are they going to know to pay attention to those things and what to pay attention to? You know, would they be able to do, even if the person was in physically good condition, would they immediately be able to run an obstacle course or something like that? Am I the only one who ever thinks about these things? You know, just, I, I, you know, I, you know I, I really don't know. And I think, you know, a person too, when they first get saved, they're not just going to automatically understand everything about the Bible. You know, you got to kind of start from scratch and they'll slowly begin to learn and they'll start seeing things. But, you know, it's it's going to take some time. But Jesus, so he is, he, you know, he's that light. He, while he's in the world, he's got to take advantage of these opportunities. And, you know, when we're out witnessing or when you're not even just out witnessing, when you're anywhere, we don't know when we're going to get another chance to witness to somebody we've got to take advantage of the opportunities we have jesus was doing that right here it's the sabbath day but here's a man who's blind and not only does he need his sight but he needs to get saved and so jesus he was going to take full advantage of it you know we don't always know when someone's heart is ready have you ever been there before when you're out soul winning and it was just like the timing was perfect that person maybe was going through something in their life or there, you know, there's been times I've talked to people too. And, you know, they had just been talking with somebody else about this very thing or just been reading their Bible. I mean, there's been, I can't tell you how many times I've knocked on someone's door trying to give them the gospel. And there has been something going on in their life that has had them thinking about it. And then when all of a sudden you show up, man, they are ready to listen. And, you know, so that's, you know, we don't, we don't always know when someone's heart's ready. You know, we don't always know too, who's going to be the one to have faith and who won't. Some people that are just not going to listen. So we, we just need to take advantage of opportunities. We got to learn to take advantage of our chance. And Jesus in this story, notice how he puts the clay on his eyes. You know, whenever Jesus would heal people, he didn't always use the same method, did he? And here... He goes and he puts clay on his eyes. And now this is just my opinion. Okay. I think the, I think the reason he did this, I think there's a couple reasons. One, what did he tell the man to do? He told, told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. Well, that man, he could have at that moment said, all you did was put clay on my eyes. That's not going to do anything. But no, what did he do? He went, didn't he? You know why? Because he believed him. He, he had faith, and so he went and he washed. But I think another reason he did that too is because Jesus knew. We've already seen several times in the book of John how they, you know, the, the Jews were trying to kill him because he would do miracles, because he would do them on the Sabbath day. And here it is the Sabbath day again, and he goes and he heals a man. And so I think he told him to go wash just to kind of give him time to, you know, separate from him. So, you know, they're not all, you know, trying to kill him right then at that moment. Because we're going to see after this man gets healed from his blindness, it creates a huge uproar. I mean, they practically put the man on trial because he was healed of his blindness. It's, it's, this, this chapter is absolutely crazy the way these people acted. And so uh, I, I think he wanted to give himself time to kind of hide before the uproar gets started. Because it wasn't his time to die yet. And so look at verse 8. And it, sa- um, it says, oh, lost my Yeah, verse 8. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? And some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. These people are in doubt. They knew something. They knew something was up. And so we see this, um, and then in verse um, 10, Therefore they said unto him, How were thine eyes opened? He answered and said, A man is, uh, that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes, and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. Okay, so it's almost like they're practically putting this guy on trial. All right, they're like, wait, you know, something's, crazy going on here here you are you've been blind you were somebody you were sitting around begging and now you can see and you're saying it's this man jesus 
who the people already didn't like. The Pharisees, they were threatened by him. They were always getting the people stirred up. And so this miracle, it was, it was such a big deal. It ends up becoming so public, they practically put the man on trial. Once again, the religious establishment is threatened by Jesus. Because none of those Pharisees could do anything like this. And look, in verse 10, you know, it says, Therefore they said to them, How are thine eyes open? Some, what is going on here? This is impossible. What has happened? This is, this is, this is strange. Uh, and you know, the, they just could not handle questions that they couldn't answer. And then in verse 11, when he, you know, he just answered, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes. And said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received my sight. You know what else religious people can't handle? Simple answers. You know, we have the same thing going on in many areas when it comes in, in churches today. What do, we, what do we teach people? I want to know how to get saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Faith without works. What does the religious establishment say? No. Uh-uh. You're not really saved. There is no way you got saved just by faith. Isn't that what they say? No, there had to be some works too. You know, that, that's not all there is to it. And here, the, what did this man say? Hey, a man called Jesus. He did this. Isn't that what we're saying? What makes you think you're going to heaven? Hey, not me, but a man called Jesus. He saved me. I trusted him. Well, what did you do? What did you do to make him save you? I just asked. That was all I did. Ah, uh, no. There's, there is no way, and they do, they want to argue, and they'll, they'll put you on trial. And then what do a lot of these people do too? They'll start watching your life, and, you know, and if, you, if you're not perfect, if you don't repent of all your sins, you never really got saved. No, you're not, you're not really saved. And you know, they tried to tell, you know, if, if they could have, you know, they, could, they would have tried to make everybody think, no, this man's not really blind, <laughs> or this man really still is blind. And, you know, and they did try to act like maybe he wasn't blind. Maybe he had been faking it before, but then they, we're going to see they brought the parents in. Sure enough, yeah, he was born blind. But they do, they, the religious establishment, they can't handle those simple answers. They can't handle a faith in Christ alone. They can't handle the whole priesthood of the believer thing. A salvation that can get you into heaven and you don't need anyone else. And listen, folks, I love the church. I think the church is important. I think everybody should be in church. But do you all understand that you can get to heaven without this church? You can get to heaven without a pastor? And I listen, I'd love to make everybody dependent on me. It might make it easier for me to get money out of people and loyalty from people and all the things that people want from people. But you know what? You can get to heaven without me. You can get to heaven by faith in Christ alone without works. And so, and a lot of people don't like that. And so look, at, uh, let's keep reading. Verse 12, they said to him, where, where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And when it was the Sabbath day, when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes, then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto him, he put clay upon mine eyes and I wash and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was division among them. You know, they, the, the other thing the religious establishment can't handle is anyone who does anything different than they do. This isn't according to our traditions. This isn't the way it's been done over the years. This isn't what the great men of the past have done. No matter how well it works, doesn't matter, the, doesn't change, if, you know, the guy was blind and now he can see. But yet, no, this isn't the way it works. But, you know, and others just using some common sense. You know, how could a man, a man that's a sinner do works like this? Heal someone that's blind. But they did, they just, they couldn't handle it. And they, they especially can't handle anyone that can do something they can't do. That's the thing, that, because it's very clear too, you know, with Jesus and John the Baptist. Okay. Those, the, the people they had, there was no way they could deny the power that these guys had. You know, it, um, you know, the multitudes that would come to listen to these people, there was no denying there was something special about these guys. And do you realize all Jesus and John the Baptist 
would have had to do to get the Pharisees on board is just talk good to them. You know, be nice. If they'd have just been nice to them, and if he w- they would have just pretended, hey, I'm with these guys, and lifted them up a little bit, they would have all been for them. But what did those guys do? You generation of vipers. Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Jesus and John the Baptist, they preached harder on the Pharisees than they did everybody else. And so they couldn't handle that. They, could, they couldn't stand that. And in the religious world today, even, on, even amongst the Baptist denomination, as I call it, you know, you're allowed to be a little different stuff as long as you sing the praises of the higher ups. As long as you lift them up, they'll lift you up. But if you start calling them out for anything, they will act like the Pharisees did. People haven't changed, okay? Uh, people have not changed over the years one bit. And so let's keep reading in verse uh, 17. They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had uh, been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son whom ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not, or who hath opened his eyes. We know not. He is of age. Ask him. He will speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. You all see this too. And this is the way, this is the way the Jews were. This is the same. We see the same stuff today. We see this in our government. We see it in churches today that the Jews here, they were not even looking for the truth, were they? They already had decided if anyone says anything good about Jesus, they're out of the synagogue. You know, they, they weren't even interested in looking at the evidence and then determining whether or not they should throw people out of the synagogue or maybe even accept Jesus and believe him. They didn't even do it. Nope. Anyone who says anything positive about him, they are out of the synagogue. And the, his parents, they're scared. Okay, this, Their son had obviously told his parents about this. But yet they're afraid. They're just like, you know what? We weren't there. Just ask him. Because these guys had already decided. They had already determined that they were not going to listen to Jesus. They they didn't care. They were just worried about keeping their power, keeping their influence. And so then verse 24, then again called they the man that was blind. Isn't this a lot like a trial? What in the world? The guy just got his sight back and they're treating him like a criminal. And it was... uh, Then called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, whereas I was blind, now I see. Y'all recognize those words. That's where we get the words from amazing grace. Was blind, but now I see. So he said, listen, I, I don't know a whole lot. I don't know all those scriptures. They haven't invented Braille yet, and so I've never read the Bible before. I don't know the prophecies about the Messiah. I haven't heard a whole lot. Nobody ever really cared about me before. I was blind. I was a beggar. Nobody ever shared anything with me. But a man named Jesus came along, and I can see. And you know what? That should be, that, that's, that should be our testimony. You know what? I don't know everything. I don't know, understand how everything works. I don't know. You don't have to know that much about the Bible. But one, one thing you do, you can know, if you'll trust in Christ, you can be saved. And you'll be able to sing Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. The saved wretch like me, once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Person who gets saved, they can say that. And that's what he said. And then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? They've already asked him this, and he's already told them. He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? I don't know if he's getting smart with them here or if he's just seriously dumbfounded by this. He's like, you know, I've told you this and you didn't hear. 
You want to know why a lot of people don't get anything out of church and they don't get anything out of preaching and they don't get anything out of reading the Bible? It's because the Bible doesn't say what they want it to say. The preacher is not saying what they want him to say. Many people, they do. They come into church, they've got an agenda. This is what I want to hear. And if you don't say that, they're not going to listen. And, there are, and there's some people, they don't have ears to hear. Jesus said to them, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Why was he saying that? Were there some people that were there that didn't have ears? Spiritually, he's speaking, isn't he? Not everyone has ears to hear. And so, and here, these people obviously didn't either. And so he did, you know, are you wanting to be his disciples? Are you wanting to follow him? Is that why you want to keep hearing this story? And then he says in verse 28, then they reviled him and said, thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. See, they can't, these people, they can't accept the fact that someone who is not from their group can be of God. And isn't that what we do today in religions? And even just amongst Baptists, we're constantly forming groups, factions, clubs, denominations practically. And if you are not from our camp, that's a a term Baptists use, if you're not from our camp, you can't be of God. If you didn't graduate from a certain Bible college, you can't be of God. If it doesn't matter what's going on in the church. It doesn't matter if people in the church are getting saved. It doesn't matter if God's blessing and doing great things. What does everybody do to a church and to a pastor that's not on their list that's being successful in accomplishing something? What do they do? They question the motives. They question the methods. Is that really of God? Oh, no, they're not, they're, they're not really of God. If they were really of God, they would do things the way they do them. If that church was, you know, that Liberty Baptist church, there's no way they're of God. They use Bible truth hymns instead of soul stirring songs and hymns. You know, I mean, they'll come, I mean, we, you know, we come up with all these stupid things. Nobody's ever gone that far. That's an exaggeration. But I mean, some people are like that. And that's how these guys are. Where are Moses' disciples? And, you know, you're, you're following Jesus, and we do. We've always got to put somebody in a camp because most people do. They don't think for themselves. Most Christians today, especially Baptists, they they do not know how to form their doctrine from the Bible. They've got to go to some professor of a university somewhere. Hey, what am I supposed to be teaching? They got to go download a doctrinal statement from one of their colleges, their alma mater, to figure out how they're supposed to teach on different doctrines. They can't just read the Bible and figure it out themselves. They got to make sure they don't do anything that would separate them from their group because then they're going to get you know called out and people aren't going to like them. And you know what? I think that's a bunch of garbage. I think that's ridiculous and that is going on today and it's always gone on and it will always go on until Jesus comes. And so, you know, they you know people they they can't fathom that someone that's not a part of their group you know is is of God. Once again, that priesthood the believer thing. That's one of the Baptist distinctives. That you can get to God and have a relationship with God without a priest. You can do that. You can get saved and go to heaven without me. Without Liberty Baptist Church. That is possible. And so, uh, let's keep reading in verse 30. The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Boy, look at... Here he go. They practically put him on trial because he got healed of his blindness and because they didn't like his story. And the guy didn't know what to do. So, folks, I'm sorry. I don't know what to do. But this is what happened. This is literally what happened. A man named Jesus came along. He anointed my eyes. I washed and I can see. I'm sorry. That's not what y'all wanted to hear. But that's the truth. I don't know any other way to tell it. 
I've told it to you over and over again. And what did they do? They said, you were born in sins. That's why you were blind. But nobody even bothers to say, okay, so now why can you see? What did they do? I don't like where this is going. And they cast them out. And boy, that happens too. Anytime you're having a good doctrinal discussion and people start to lose, what do they usually, they usually cast you out. One of the, one of the be- biggest arguments I get for everything, and this is what, I mean, this, this is all, whenever I start to win an argument, I, pe- preachers always use this on me, and I've never figured out how to come back from it. It's a comeback I just can't handle. This is the argument when I say anything that they can't handle. And then they walk away. I haven't figured out a good comeback for that one yet. <laughs> but, but that's what usually happens. I mean, they, they just, they'll start foaming at the mouth, run away, whatever. And that's kind of what they did here with this guy. You know what? Get out of here. We don't like your story. This isn't what we wanted to hear. This doesn't line up with what we think. Just, you know what? Get out of here. And so they, they cast him out. It's so verse 35. Jesus heard that they cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? See, Jesus wasn't done with this guy yet. Jesus wasn't done with him yet. Jesus hadn't done what really needed to be done with this man. The most important thing, what he came to do, it was not just to heal people of their blindness. Verse 36, And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. What did he just do right there? He believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, didn't he? And that man got saved right there. Believed on Christ, got saved. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. Y'all see that? Jesus came to give sight to the blind and blindness to those who see. What does that mean? Verse 40. Pharisees wondered about that too. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. What's that? Once again, with the Pharisees who had no faith, Jesus starts kind of talking in parables and stuff. And because these people, they, just, they refuse to listen. But basically what he is saying right here, you know, he's showing this was his mission. It was to give sight to the spiritually blind And he was trying to teach them in order to be saved, you must realize you're lost. The problem that these Pharisees had is they thought they were saved because they kept the law. They thought they kept the law. They thought because they were Abraham's seed, or in this case, the disciples of Moses, they thought that they were saved because of those things. And you know what? Jesus, he's, he did nothing for them. I came not to call the righteous. But sinners, was Jesus saying that the Pharisees were righteous? No, but he was saying they think they're righteous, therefore they didn't believe his words. Because he would, he, I mean, he called them out all the time. He pointed, he would, he would always do things to point out their sins. That rich young ruler that came to Jesus, when Jesus told him he needed to sell everything he had and give to the poor, He was not telling him to do that because that's what you need to do in order to get saved. Or that was what he needed to do in order to get saved. Jesus told him to do that to show him that he had not kept the commandments. Because he said, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And they start talking about the commandments. And he goes and he's like, all these have I kept from my youth up. But the truth is, that man loved his possessions more than he loved God. And what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He loved his possessions more than God. That man was a lawbreaker. That man was a sinner. And he didn't realize it. And therefore, Jesus couldn't do anything for him. And that man went away sorrowful. He went away blind. 
And that's what Jesus is talking about here. And he, when he says, if ye were blind, ye should have no sin. In other words, if you would realize that you're a sinner, if you, if you would realize that, if you would acknowledge that, if you'd call on me like that blind man had done, you would be saved. But you know what? You say you see. You think you're righteous. You think you're okay. Therefore, your sin remaineth. And there are many people today sitting in churches, what we would call good religious people. There's no way these people could be on their way to hell. Look how good they are. They go to church all the time. They give their money. But listen, they have never been born again. They have never trusted in the work of Jesus Christ for their salvation. While they might impress the daylights out of us, they don't impress God one bit. Their righteousness is still as a filthy rag in the eyes of God. And He will not forgive their sins if they won't even acknowledge that they are a sinner. If they think that their church attendance and their you know, Christianity is going to get them to heaven, they are blind. Anyone who thinks that they are good enough to go to heaven is blind. They cannot see. And, we've, and that's what Jesus is trying to say right here. But those who realize that they're a sinner, those who realize they are scum, those are the ones who usually get saved. Those are the ones who can get saved. And so he's trying to teach them in order to get saved, they must realize they're lost. And you know, I believe today that religion is doing more to send people to hell than anything in the world. Listen, I am 100% for what we do here. I am 100% for, you know, our style of church. You know, I'm, I'm all for stand, have, you know, teaching standards and convictions and following the Word of God. But you know what? Sometimes even in good Baptist churches that teach good things like we do, Sometimes it comes, it becomes all about the outward things. It becomes, you know, just religious practices. And it's not about Jesus Christ. And a lot of times we send a wrong message. We think, you know, it's like people think, all right, if I'm going to go to heaven, I've got to start dressing like these people and looking like these people and talking like these people. Listen, you can do everything we do. You can do everything that I teach and that I preach. But if you have never put your faith and trust in the work of Jesus Christ, you're on your way to hell. And it's, it's becoming way too much about religious practices, and I believe it's hurting. And everyone, everyone's out there trying to build a following or an earthly religion, or you could even say an earthly kingdom. That's what most pre preachers are on a mission of doing, most pastors. But we are supposed to be building a heavenly kingdom. That's what we are here for. And we build those with people of faith. Not with people who are what we would call good. And so that's why we need to just keep on going and getting the gospel wherever we can. Going wherever we can. We're going to go out to Lanner this Saturday. Go soul winning out there. We're probably not going to get too many of those people to visit our church. It's, pretty good. it's a pretty good distance away. But you know what? If those people call on the Lord. If they get saved, they will go to heaven. We can help build the earthly kingdom. That is the most important thing. And so Jesus Christ, He is the light of the world. If people want to be able to see, they're going to if spiritually, they have to put their faith and trust in Him. And so with that, let's all stand together. We've got we've got a severe weather alarm. So yeah. alarms.